<laughs> Thanks for the chair, man. This guy. <sighs> okay, so we're on Facebook. Hey, Dane, I'm going to turn you into the host. Let me start the recording. Record to our, to our cloud. And hey, Dane, I'm now making you the uh, host, okay? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do you need to share this? We'll be, I'm gonna turn my camera and mic off, but we'll be on standby, okay? And uh, thank you. Not, I have to travel around, so if it's an emergency, just okay. Yes, right. thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. You are also very welcome. <laughs> welcome, everybody. We're gonna get started at one o'clock, so just four minutes. So bear with us, and we'll start at one o'clock. And Nadine, I'm amenable to any kind of time constraints. You know, um, I'll, I'll do a little bit of an overview, but uh, feel free to give me a look or, you know, just interrupt me. That's totally fine. Uh, I, I want to be as inclusive as possible, make sure that everyone's voices can be uh, heard, not just the curly one. Sure, no problem. Usually like a 10 or 15 minute intro, and then we, we jump into questions. There are sessions where we don't, get a lot of feedback, um, but the last one we did run over a little bit and didn't have time to address all of the questions. So we'll do our best to keep it within the, the one hour time frame. And for some reason, I thought it was gonna be a nice day, but it's really not. So we might get more attendees than we expected. So might be a good thing. So well, I see the Philip Roth Book Club orange um, background is uh, giving the kind of uh, brightness uh, in spring like um, color that I need. Yeah, it's really wet and dreary here too. And I say we've got five attendees so far. We've got we've got somebody from South Korea. Hello there. Um, and then I see we've got uh, uh, one of Roth's biographers, Ira, on here. Hi, Ira. How are you, Ira? Hi. Uh, look I'm what fine. I have. And it's I'm not going to wear it the whole time, but here it is. I think it looks fantastic. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, it's actually sunny and warm in Vancouver. Isn't that shocking? Yes. Totally shocking. We well, don't know how to deal with such nice weather here. Thank you for being here. Yeah, of course.
Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for a Zoom discussion of Nemesis. I'm Nadine, the Philip Roth Personal Library Librarian at the Newark Public Library, and I look forward to learning more about this work. Please feel free to type a question into the chat box or a comment or into the Q&A, and we'll get to them um, later on in the program. And please note that if you're using the chat, please do send the message to all panelists and all participants so everybody can see your question. Um, once we get into the question segment of the program, um, you can also raise your hand and I will unmute you in the order that I see your hand raised. We will try to get as many questions as possible within the one hour time frame of this book club. It's possible I might not get to all of your questions. And this webinar is also being recorded. Uh, please note that Nemesis was Roth's last novel, and we're discussing it just two days before the anniversary of his death. Uh, and we did have a program about Nemesis and COVID a few years ago, and you can find that on the Philip Roth Personal Library YouTube page, which you can find off of the Philip Roth Personal Library website. Our host today is John Curley, poet, critic, and teacher in the Humanities and Social Sciences Department at the New Jersey Institute of Technology. He teaches a popular literature seminar called Newark Narratives, for which Philip Roth serves as a radiant cornerstone. I've gotten to know John because he brings his students to the Philip Roth Personal Library, and in fact, we had several classes visit us last semester. And one student was so inspired, she actually created a 3D model of the Newark Public Library, and that is now on display in the lobby of the Newark Public Library in the back as you walk through the lobby into the LGBTQ room. So if you're ever stopping by the library, please do take a look at that because it's lovely. So I would like to introduce you to John Curley. Uh, John Curley, before you begin your discussion of Nemesis, perhaps you could just touch on how you got into Roth and tell us a little bit about the Newark Narratives class because I think that's very interesting. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I apologize if uh, um, the uh, glare of my shaved pate uh, rivals uh, Jeff Bezos of uh, Amazon, but uh, it's time for spring and transformation. So it had to go off. Um, in any case, uh, my relationship with Roth uh, in Newark uh, extends back to a sleepy southeastern Massachusetts town where I grew up and uh, which um, hosts a uh, state college, the first normal school, uh, the first um, institution in America to teach teachers how to teach. Um, my father's a professor. Um, I was born with a passionate love of learning and uh, books, uh, but I didn't uh, really have much in the way of uh, a public school education that was uh, uh, really credible to, to call it uh, an education. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the town that I live in, Bridgewater, Massachusetts, um, oftentimes there's talk that the high school is going to uh, lose its accreditation. So at a fairly early age, um, I decided some people self-medicate. Um, I decided to self-educate. And uh, it wasn't rough. Um, but really, in some ways, uh, his nemesis that I discovered uh, while going through the stacks, I was trying to, uh, as a, a teenager, um, 13 years old, I was basically trying to get a textbook learning in all the disciplines, probably not the most ideal form of learning for some, but basically, you know, A through Z, anthropology, zoology, and uh, poetry um, was part of that, of course. Uh, I didn't think that poetry would be much uh, uh, in the way of my life, didn't think that I would read it much, didn't think I would write it and become a, a poet. Um, but I remember uh, looking uh, through um, a, a work by someone named Leroy Jones, and uh, the title of the book was called uh, The Dead Lecturer, and uh, I felt that he was snarling um, directly at me, and uh, so I read a few of these uh, poems, um, didn't quite understand the title, of the volume Dead Lecturer and didn't really understand all that I was reading. But uh, uh, as T.S. Eliot um, opined that, uh, you know, sometimes poems and words um, can communicate before they're understood. And that was certainly the case uh, with uh, Leroy Jones. And I remember uh, making it a point to see where uh, these poems were coming from. And they were from a uh, midtown, uh, sorry, mid um, sized industrial city uh, in New Jersey called Newark, and I never knew I'd have a connection uh, specifically with uh, Newark, but it was uh, definitely on the mental map. 
uh, years later, uh, Amiri Baraka um, became a mentor uh, of mine. And uh, Roth became a spiritual advisor uh, over the years. Um, you know, my background is in Irish studies, uh, specifically Northern Irish studies, poetry of the Troubles. Um, but I delved into Roth even prior to beginning to teach in uh, Newark. And um, this uh, seminar that Nadine was uh, mentioning was uh, in part formulated uh, with Amiri Baraka on the campus of New Jersey Institute of Technology. I told them that I was going to adopt this uh, then in print book, the Leroy Jones Amiri Baraka Reader, and I was going to devote an entire class all to his work. And uh, Amiri said to me, it's like, no, no, you, you, you can't make it just about me. Newark has many artists. There are many stories to be told. You have to tell those stories. So Newark stories didn't sound like a worthwhile senior literature seminar, but Newark narratives uh, did. And um, so I had an avid interest in Newark and its history, uh, literary and otherwise anyway. But this is a, a, a class that was in some ways designed by Miri Baraka in conversation with him, three conversations uh, just three months before he passed away. Uh, but it was also born of uh, indignation. And since I'm named after Jonathan Swift, I guess I could call that savage uh, indignation. But uh, um, at the time I was living in Newark, I was teaching at New Jersey Institute of Technology where I continue uh, to teach. And uh, this class was born of a, a great indignation. I had come from spending a Fulbright year in Ireland and uh, Northern Ireland, uh, specifically Derry, please don't call it Londonderry. Um, and I felt in some ways that uh, the, um, the disposition of so many of my colleagues and students uh, seemed to be a kind of colonial mentality. Um, you know, was, was NGIT, was its campus a, a garrison? It seemed that I'd have students four or five years um, educating on site and uh, yet never stepped off campus, knew nothing about Newark, uh, a lot of just, uh, you know, negative toxic stereotypes about the city uh, and its citizens. Um, uh, you know, colleagues would tell me when I first moved to Newark, uh, John, I know that you're uh, uh, an intensive walker, uh, you know, just be careful as they get into their Volvos and drive off to uh, Maplewood or some other leafy uh, New Jersey um, suburb. So in some ways, this class was born out of a kind of frustration. Um, most of my students uh, are outstanding at NGIT. Um, I think a lot of them self-identify as so-called STEM students. Uh, you know, uh, NGIT is the largest New Jersey polytechnical um, institute. Um, but um, I try to engage students and tell them that uh, they don't have to be just this or that. They can be this and this and this and this. And, you know, I tell them, and this is true, you know, I got my uh, graduate degrees uh, in one field just because I couldn't graze in all the fields. But I've never, ever compartmentalize myself. Again, that's sectarian thinking going back to uh, 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 the colonies of Northern Ireland and whatnot. So um, the cornerstones of my class are Philip Roth and um, uh, Amiri Baraka, um, with many other artists, um, including documentary filmmakers, uh, the Bongiornos, who have a searing uh, trilogy, uh, the R trilogy, dedicated to Newark. Um, you, you're more than welcome also after the session uh, to reach me either by jcurley at ngit.edu or john at johncurley.com. If you're in Newark, come take uh, my seminar. Uh, I'd love to have you there. Um, but in any case, um, so um, American Pastoral had been the cornerstone for this class. And then maybe about four years ago, I added uh, Nemesis. And before I did that, so just before the pandemic, maybe a year and a half before the pandemic. Um, I put uh, Nemesis onto the uh, syllabus, into the curriculum, and I told the last class that took the Newark Narratives class, Sans Nemesis, that it would be one of the most devastating um, sad stories that they would ever read in their lifetime. And uh, one of the students who had graduated uh, came back to campus, um, I believe it was the next uh, fall, late in the semester, and as I was walking to my night class, someone gave a ginger tap to my shoulder and said, God damn you, John Curley, um, I read Nemesis, and it was the saddest story I've ever read, and I did cry. I was like, there you go. Um, preparing for uh, today's discussion uh, last night, um, you know, I'm just off the um, spring semester, and um, I was teaching three 
um, sections of this senior seminar, two honors sections. And um, I reread American Pastoral and Nemesis every single semester alongside the students. And we try to dissect these um, works, not just as literary texts, but see if we can unpack them culturally, sociologically, uh, and so forth. Um, and I was going through last night, um, uh, rereading the text and uh, going, uh, making some notes. And uh, yeah, I felt that kind of almost debilitating devastation uh, that first rocked me when I first read this, uh, maybe several weeks after it was published uh, in uh, 2010. Um, it is um, you know, perhaps predicated on um, the unanswerable question. Um, why is it that we human beings continue to pose questions that are unanswerable. Um, the rabbi Harold Kushner just died a couple of weeks ago. He had a 1981 bestseller, uh, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Um, uh, we who are empirically minded, we who are scientifically admi uh, minded, we of the 21st century, we should stop asking such insufferably ridiculous abstract questions, and yet we continue uh, to do so. Um, and so, um, with the story of Bucky Cantor comes a tale um, that um, basically um, brings us uh, to that uh, issue. And um, um, I, I, I want to assure you that uh, I am a professor, uh, and the reason why I teach is because I want to learn. It's one of the easiest questions. Um, but um, in the summer of 2020, um, it's the first and only time in my uh, life that I will be. Um, uh, given the adulation or given the appointment of being uh, a prophet. Um, and I can assure you, I'm not a prophet. I can't predict how the session is going to go. I can't predict what's going to happen uh, in one hour, 10 uh, years, or 100. Uh, but in anyway, in the summer of 2020, I had many students who had attended the Newark Narratives class, um, and many of whom who had not kept in touch, many of whom who uh, uh, had voices I had not heard in the classroom. But in the summer of 2020, I got loads of um, um, these very excited uh, emails uh, saying, John, oh my gosh, your Newark Narratives class predicted everything. Um, here we are stuck in this pandemic. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm back in Newark in 1944. And it's the outbreak of poliomyelitis. And all of a sudden, we're here with Black Lives Matter. And you taught us about uh, Black nationalism and the Black Power Movement and Amiri uh, Baraka. It's like, you called it. You predicted it all. And it just goes to prove that uh, history repeats itself. And uh, I enjoyed the compliment, but I had to disabuse themselves of uh, two notions. One, that I'm a prophet. Uh, and two, that uh, history repeats itself. Those kind of uh, reflexive kind of uh, stances don't allow us to be critical creatures and really see what are the correspondences and what are the, some of the dissimilarities as uh, we human beings make patterns across the horizon um, of our heritage and our uh, destiny. Um, uh, it's interesting in terms of reader reception uh, or, um, in the fall of 2020, or maybe I should back up into uh, spring of 2020. Uh, when NGIT went online in mid-March of 2020 at the beginning of uh, the pandemic or the beginning of our episode of the pandemic, uh, the administration uh, emphasized that we uh, uh, professors should not um, attempt to hold class online uh, synchronically. Um, all was going to be remote, and um, it was going to be asynchronic, and um, and uh, all four of my classes, three of which were this Newark Narratives class, um, asked if we could still meet on Tuesdays and Fridays at one o'clock, um, and it was, you know, basically group mutual therapy to an extent. We got through uh, American Pastoral, we got through uh, Nemesis. Um, I uh, a, a book of poetry uh, came out of it uh, because every time we would sit down in session, uh, students would ask, John, how are you doing? And I would toggle this here uh, computer uh, to Second Avenue here in New York City. I'm, um, I'm reaching you now at the corner of East 25th Street um, and Second Avenue. And people would ask, uh, John, how are you doing? And I said, well, here we are. It should be uh, mid-afternoon traffic on Second Avenue. I'd toggle my computer so people could see the Empire State Building, Hello King Kong, and then see uh, desolate Second Avenue. And uh, it became even more perplexing, more troubling, uh, more um, psychic uh, destruction 
when several days later, you know, I live right near Bellevue Hospital, I live right near NYU Langone, and when in early April of 2020, I started making walks up to the hospital, uh, days when over 900 people uh, were dying um, every day, and uh, seeing um, human bodies stacked like uh, cordwood, uh, um, uh, messily organized um, around the perimeter of the hospital with refrigerated trucks trying to get bodies in. It was, you know, I, I felt like I had walked uh, into Dante's Inferno, and I did. Um, and what was very interesting, I'd, very, uh, I'd be very curious of uh, all your uh, reactions to the reading of Nemesis prior to our uh, pandemic and then into it. But um, I couldn't answer that question. Um, I tried to, but students would ask, how are you doing? And uh, the only way I could answer that was to publish a long uh, poem uh, called Remnant Halo, published by Marsh Hawk uh, Press. But that was basically my provisional um, um, uh, expression, um, my stance, uh, my, my feelings about what was uh, happening. Uh, and what was very interesting in the first full um, pandemic uh, semester, the fall of 2020, in which I begged my department to uh, teach in the classroom. I wanted to normalize class. I didn't want to be sitting. I wanted to be standing with a lectern to try to normalize the experience with students who were, uh, I hardly had anyone in the classroom. And even when I said, I've got my second COVID test this week, please come and join me. We'll all wear masks. People um, couldn't um, uh, find it in themselves to uh, come. And I I understood uh, that. But in the fall of uh, 2020, the reception of Nemesis, much like the students who got in touch with me in the uh, summer, um, the long um, disrupting summer of 2020, um, it was revelatory for them. Uh, for them, uh, the experience of Bucky Cantor and all these uh, poor young people in Newark in 1944 um, there was a historical bridge that was crossed and also a kind of empathy and sympathy that crystallized with my students. They, they could see themselves within the test, the text, and they found it, that it was nurturing and enhancing. Well, by the next semester, uh, students in that crop of classes, the majority of them said, I, I, I can't read this. I, I, it it, it uh, is triggering, John, and I just can't uh, get through it. And I understood, of course, um, both uh, reactions. Um, my own uh, uh, sort of um, ongoing reaction is, as a theologian once said long ago, truth is where the uh, uh, danger lies. And sometimes uh, to confront uh, the um, irreducibly um, um, discomforting, disturbing, devastating, uh, whether through literature or through our lives, maybe that is um, of uh, fundamental importance. Sometimes we can't avert our eyes. Sometimes we have to uh, pull our own callers closer uh, to um, whatever uh, is uh, occurring. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd be very curious how, um, and again, I can come back in, but I'm very curious how people situate themselves with this text. Um, I also, um, uh, uh, very curious, you know, from a um, not just a sociological level, but a literary um, one. It's written in 2010. Um, it's the last Philip Roth book, um, as Nadine was mentioning. Um, one could maybe theorize um, a la Frank Kermode or uh, Edward Said to uh, well-known literary critics that this is uh, late style. We see it, uh, I, I guess Adorno also mentions late style. We see it in Beethoven. Or do we? We see it in Yeats. Um, these uh, nemesis novels, um, um, uh, Indignation, Every Man, The Humbling, and Nemesis are all um, shorter works. Um, the style is even truncated to a certain extent. Um, does this um, indicate a certain kind of stylistic uh, decision? Um, this is also in some way the end point, certainly not the epitaph, but the end point of Philip Roth's um, career. Um, um, a person who uh, was given vigorously to deny any kind of uh, religious belief, um, and uh, certainly Arnie Met uh, Mesikoff meeting Bucky Cantor many years later in downtown Newark, um, certainly in some ways encircles that kind of uh, mentality, but uh, this is also riven through uh, with um, notions of the theological and also notions 
of the absurd. Um, but I'm very curious how people construe this novel in the legacy of Roth's, you know, overarching uh, oeuvre. Um, I also asked my students, how do you think Philip Roth, um, um, who sadly passed away, as you know, um, eight years ago this coming Monday, um, how would Philip Roth have written this um, in the face of COVID-19? Um, um, American Pastoral, how would that be uh, written if not in 1995, 1996, but in 2016, 2018, 2019? Again, these are questions we have to pose, but we can't get uh, answers, but uh, we can definitely maybe get um, provisional uh, stances. And uh, that, said, uh, that said, to also drum up support for um, the New York Public Library and its uh, wealth of materials, um, talk about therapy and also um, radical education. Um, I was sitting at this very uh, chair on this very computer in June, I think it was June 12th of 2020, and took in that uh, conversation um, with a medical doctor and a few other panelists about Nemesis. And uh, that was definitely a session uh, for me to learn. It was also a session for me uh, to cope. And I'm still coping, and perhaps maybe it's geographical, um, being uh, near so many hospitals that were devastated by this uh, virus. Uh, but for me, um, I'm happy that most of the world has been able to achieve some kind of uh, if not stasis, some security in this, is it the post-pandemic world? Um, but part of me is still kind of traumatized. And uh, when I see that uh, there's kind of normalcy, uh, some sort of return to the pre-2020 uh, world, um, I'm both um, grateful and I'm also a little bit disturbed. But anyway, oh, and that's a great, uh, Edward, uh, how would Roth have approached the plot against America if he was writing in 2016? Or January six, or how about January twenty seven, uh, January seventh, twenty twenty one. Go ahead, John, if you want to think about that, or if anybody else wants to chime in, please raise your hand, and I will unmute you. And we can also, um, you know, bleed over onto other maps and onto uh, other Roth texts uh, as well. Um, uh, I, th I think it's the Roth critic, Michael Kimmage, who uh, mentioned that uh, Newark uh, is always present. Even it, it's the almost the kind of Spinozian uh, absent present, that even when it's not dead center in the narrative, it informs uh, everything. And uh, as I was reading Nemesis um, in the classroom or during the semester, I try to have the dual consciousness of being able to read it as the educator um, and also read it as uh, the student. Um, Reading it afresh last night, uh, maybe it's because we are straddling in some ways, uh, just a couple of weeks ago was the, was the um, anniversary of the publication of James Joyce's uh, uh, 1939 Finnegan's Wake, uh, which people call an unreadable uh, novel. Uh, it's eminently readable, uh, but it's just, uh, it just because it's um, populated by people, it's very difficult and messy because people are difficult and messy. Um, and we're also close to Bloomsday, June 6th, um, when um, uh, Ulysses, um, Ulysses, sorry, I have to uh, say it with the, enunciate it with the Dublin accent. Um, uh, you know, Joyce famously mentioned that uh, if tomorrow Dublin disappeared, you could reconstruct it by reading his books. And I was uh, uh, vicariously moving through the Waquaic section of Newark last night and thinking that uh, Nemesis, even beyond the central court issues of Bucky uh, Cantor's uh, fate, um, that uh, just the mapping of uh, the, uh, the neighborhoods, uh, I would encourage you if you've never visited Newark or never ventured into the Wequaic section, um, take whatever Newark-based Roth book, and I think that you will have no problems getting uh, to the intersection of Summit and Chancellorville, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And another kind of maybe philosophical or psychoanalytic perspective I'd want to raise um, is that um, most of my students, you know, are graduating, they're, they're almost exactly the same age uh, of Bucky Cantor. Um, they're at the uh, age that they're proverbially, all, all my students just uh, who are graduating, graduated yesterday, the ceremony was. And uh, yeah, it's the time for 
um, postgraduate destiny. It's the time for that great self-actualization, adulthood, encountering many, many challenges, but all the possibilities of uh, being an adult. And uh, understandably, most students are just absolutely repulsed by Bucky Cantor's decision to become basically a figure of death in life, a person who has fundamentally committed suicide at an age when one is supposed to burgeon and blossom. And um, I try to sort of aid and abet that kind of mentality. And maybe it's the, uh, I don't believe in astrology, but uh, I am uh, uh, born after my father's uh, aborted doctoral dissertation on Jonathan Swift. Um, so maybe I have, uh, and also um, uh, my daughter, um, who's in the other room, Ariana, she was meant to be born on Samuel Beckett's uh, birthday. Um, so she is Ariana Beckett Curley, ABC. Um, but maybe the informing presences of uh, Roth's uh, text in uh, Jonathan Swift and Samuel Beckett, uh, that I tell students that um, I absolutely can understand and empathize with Bucky Cantor's decisions and students, sometimes their eyes go like saucers and like, but he just gives up. And I said, well, you know, how often have we on a certain scale in our life, you know, short circuited uh, possibilities and uh, have done it as an act of personal self terrorism that we've blown some kind of situation or possibility. Um, we've exempted ourselves from that possibility, knowing that we're just destroying um, uh, what could have happened, setting the worlds, our personal worlds, perhaps on fire. It's, you know, Please do not do this at home, but even the temptation to do so. Um, again, we can always relate everything to the world of uh, Newark. Well, you know, Albert Camus, the French philosopher, said, you know, the first um, decision we have to make is suicide, is uh, life worth uh, living. And then, of course, we can bring up the fact that uh, when during uh, the rising rebellion riots of 1967, when uh, Leroy Jones, soon to be Amiri Baraka, disappeared into the Essex County um, legal labyrinth and was not informed by his family where he was actually uh, being imprisoned. It took a phone call from um, Jones's uh, good friend, Allen Ginsberg, uh, calling Jean-Paul Sartre in Paris to say, hey, can you call the cops in Essex County and tell us where Leroy is? And Jean-Paul got on uh, the phone and uh, may we, we discovered where he was. So you can bring French philosophy. And even um, I ask students, you know, looking at Bucky Cantor, looking at your own lives, looking at the pandemic worlds, uh, a world that uh, perhaps Camus was uh, right um, with another novel, The Plague, uh, where basically the whole moral of the story is not the virus per se, but how do people react in those kind of uh, uh, conditions? Um, and uh, I never want to clip the wings of my soaring, you know, graduates, but uh, we start to talk looking at Bucky Cantor, looking at um, uh, Seymour Sweet Levov. Um, let's look at these figures. Let's talk about how much free will um, do we have? How much of our fate um, is decided by us? And what are all the other determining factors? Uh, and is the world uh, trying to smite us every with every breath we take? So anyway. Would love let, to me hear <laughs> let me read the comment from Rick. Um, Sam and Rushdie gave one of the first Philip Roth talks at the Newark Public Library. Half of his talk was literary and the other half talked about how prescient plot against America was and the importance of voting against Trump. Absolutely. And um, my, my parents, uh, when I was a teenager and I was prone to wear my hair like this, I just... Uh, shaved it off uh, recently. Um, but I saw um, the epidemic, um, worse than a pandemic, but I saw the epidemic of um, white nationalism, uh, neo-Nazism, white power movements here and there infiltrating um, the local Boston uh, mu uh, music scene that I was involved with. And my parents uh, used to ask me, it's like, John, why are you so obsessed uh, with uh, neo-Nazisms and anti-Semitism and white power? Um, and 
it's, you know, just all so displaced. I said, wait until the spotlights uh, come up because I said, it's there. I see it in my own musical scene. It is just like waiting to break down the gates, but it has been there. It is there now and uh, it will continue to be. Uh, I'm definitely not a, a fatalist uh, to quote uh, one of Amiri Baraka's friends, James Baldwin uh, from the 2017 Oscar winning um, documentary, I'm Not Your Negro one of the most beautiful and brilliant quotations a human being has ever uttered. Um, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. Uh, but um, the plot against America, I think, is an instructive guidebook to uh, mid 20th century America. It's also the America of the now as well. Again, please feel free to raise your hand. I'll, I'll mute you if you have a question or a comment, or you can also type it in the chat. Uh, let's see, Lawrence, the narrator of Nemesis says about Bucky that a good ruined boy can't be salvaged. The book may be a psychological study of the good Jewish boy unprepared to confront the unrighteousness of life. And that comes from page uh, 272 um, in my copy. This is my original copy. I have several copies. Uh, but this first uh, book uh, copy, uh, the Book of Lamentations, I purchased at the uh, Harvard Bookstore um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, book hunting uh, with my father. Um, this copy of my book is uh, riddled um, with stains, uh, tear stains. And um, even reading that quotation uh, last night, you know, found me, as the Irish would say, in my cups. Um, I've had a few students that uh, I guess um, they have the, um, I don't know, a certain kind of, uh, the bulwarks of a kind of millennial sturdiness. Uh, I've had a few students after finishing this in class say, John, I don't know what you're talking about. I thought this was a really good story, but I didn't find it uh, sad at all. Um, whereas, yeah, I oftentimes when I'm commuting, snaking through the streets of Newark and I find myself walking across Military Park and onto Broad Street, um, even though, again, it's only encoded within the book uh, and I don't read books uh, to have them translate into my mind into uh, world cinema. Uh, but there's something very cinematic um, when Arnold talks about that encounter uh, with Mr. Cantor uh, in 1971, Newark, uh, that predates my biological existence. And yet I feel as if I'd walked down the streets of Newark in 1971 and seen this slightly infirmed uh, person that uh, was someone who, when I was a child, back in 1944, meant so much to me. Um, I think also, uh, another one of my influences, thinking about Arnie and how the boys just adore uh, Bucky Cantor, um, that I, I had two um, quasi-mystical experiences at the same college library, the Clement C. Maxwell Library at Bridgewater State College, now Bridgewater State University, I was discovering Baraka at the age of 13, and then attending what was probably my first real uh, poetry reading uh, with Seamus Heaney as a high school student. And maybe the third poem that he recited in, um, uh, it, uh, it felt like a uh, mystical experience simply because it was almost a physiological effect. I felt as someone was putting their hand on my shoulder saying, this is part of your mission. But uh, Heaney, uh, like Roth, is able to charge the atmosphere, the commonplace, the quotidian, with the miraculous. Uh, and so ultimately, I find Nemesis simply because that final five page scene where Arnie recounts Bucky with the javelin, it almost, it's a book of lamentation, but it also strikes me uh, a, a work of some kind of redemption because no matter how much Bucky has self suicided, um, and he's not just devastated his uh, um, own life, but Marcia's, or how my, uh, many of my students uh, pronounce it, Marcia, which I think is very beautiful. Uh, but he has, you know, uh, woven a certain kind of um, uh, trapdoor logic to life for many people, not just himself, but ultimately, even last night when I was trying to read like Braille the tear stains in my uh, copy, um, I can see Bucky with that javelin. And all of a sudden, there's a certain kind of mightiness and hope that is restored in that Bucky Cantor, whose uh, um, own savage indignation uh, becomes just a personal obliteration, a document of self-annihilation, there he is restored. And uh, it uh, last night, I must say, it really made me uh, swoon 
Um, and um, yeah, anyway. Okay, let's see from Harry. Thank you, Harry. Marsha saw in Bucky a deeply moral young guy who lives in a very examined life, who lives a very examined life and thought that was ideal. By the end, she is frustrated because he is so studied and insistent on puzzling through moral questions. Through his moral seriousness, Bucky ends up looking selfish to others because he places himself in the center of every moral question and at the center of the failure to contain the polio epidemic. It's interesting how moral posturing and concern with behaving well can come around to being selfish. Absolutely. And uh, even though my students, um, again, and many of my students will admit to me, John, um, I don't know, 423 pages, American Pastoral. I don't know if I can do it. Um, and Nemesis, that's only clocks in at 280. And I see that the font uh, is uh, fairly large. I'm not sure I, I uh, can do that. Um, there, uh, it's Philip Roth, even more so than Baraka uh, at times, really just uh, allows the, uh, the possibility of literature into their lives. They couldn't believe that, wait, uh, you, you can have a, a, a um, a, a character like Mary or Rita in American Pastoral, um, but it's interesting that uh, students, uh, you know, they're not often given credit for, you know, having uh, the deep interiorities that they have, and sometimes they are probably unwilling to articulate it, but I'm always uh, surprised that uh, um, overwhelmingly there's a negative judgment on Bucky for trying to, um, you know, be such a guarantor of other people's lives. Uh, and and th there's a certain kind of harshness that permeates our discussions. And people say like, why does he take it upon himself? He's not responsible. Um, he, he, it's just ridiculous that he um, does that. And uh, of course it is, but uh, I, I think there's a rage for order that Bucky does not have in his early childhood. And I don't think that, uh, how many times have uh, people tried to set us on a Sendero Luminoso, a shining path? And again, our own natures just like get in the way. Uh, but the fact that he can't dissenter himself from that um, uh, stubbornness just really infuriates um, students. Um, and uh, I must say, when I have uh, students getting so angry, I know that uh, the work is really drawing them you know, into the moral and literary universe of Newark and, and Bucky and so forth. Daniel says, uh, you've spoken extensively about the book's connections to Newark, but how do you see the way the plot shifts between the city and country as reflecting Roth's trajectory from Newark to Warren? Um, again, I think the informing uh, presence uh, is always uh, there. Um, that um, one could argue that, you know, Newark serves as the backdrop, uh, backdrop for every single origin story, Bucky Cantor or uh, Nathan Zuckerman, uh, that uh, what is, you know, I'm glad I can be uh, vindicated by uh, politicians. Uh, oftentimes students in their course evaluations in my class um, will say, um, you know, really enjoy this class, but um, I really wish we could read um, newer works. It seems like this class is so caught up in what happened in Newark, you know, over half a century ago in July of 1967. And it's good to get the vindication of uh, Amiri Baraka's son, um, the current mayor, Ross Baraka, who in his audible book, uh, The Book of Baraka, says that, you know, 1967 is the ground zero. It informs so much of even uh, contemporary Newark as much as it's uh, so disheartening to say that. And I think that uh, that which occurs uh, with these uh, characters uh, in their youths, uh, and it's inevitably, uh, or oftentimes, uh, Newark, that Newark uh, becomes not just a city, but a kind of ghost and revenant that can never, ever uh, fully be um, um, voided from the psyches and the, and, and the persons that are uh, not just the central characters, but the peripheral uh, characters uh, as well. Sheila. Sheila writes, um, this is Nemesis' as fate, not as revenge, and is like the John O'Hara story, Appointment in Samara. You flee to avoid death, but death finds you anyway. A much fuller and more contemporary version of that theme. 
Absolutely. Um, and as my uh, students um, soon point out that uh, nemesis is uh, a singularity in the title, but it's basically um, a hydra headed foil because the nemesis is not just the conception, uh, Bucky's conception of uh, God, which um, Arnie pinpoints as what you know Bucky thinks of as God is is chance. And uh, that phrase uh, that you know basically, um, casts its uh, shadow over the entire text in all of our lives, the tyranny of contingency. Um, we see that the nemesis, it, 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 it's, it's Bucky, and it's, uh, it, it's uh, polio, and it's happenstance, uh, and it happens to be the, you know, geographical fault lines of Wequake. Um, but there's so many, and, and there's, uh, there's nemesis in the background. Uh, we have uh, the Shoah, the Holocaust, uh, happening uh, simultaneously, um, ant rank anti-Semitism um, uh, occurring in Newark, just as it's uh, spanning itself uh, across the world. So uh, it seems like uh, the enemy is uh, multiple. Um, and also, um, again, we can sort of extrapolate from uh, Bucky's confrontation with fate to just uh, try to determine how we view ourselves, um, you know, even when it comes to uh, disease. Um, you know, so often, you know, people will say like, oh, you know, I gave, uh, I gave the virus to my father. Um, and this notion of like agency and transmission and contamination that, you know, is, you know, uh, both literalized by the disease in Nemesis, but also finds its fundamental abstract achievement in basically contaminating, infecting uh, Bucky's uh, belief system, not just belief in the divine or chance, but in himself. Um, I, I, I think it's um, in, an important uh, life lesson. And I do not come from the literary school that looks uh, for uh, moral systems and belief systems uh, in uh, literature. I'm more with Oscar Wilde's, you know, there are no moral or immoral books. They're just good or bad, uh, bad books. And a lot of what I read is uh, cold and reptilian in terms of its uh, uh, approach uh, to life in uh, literature. But I think that uh, Roth is constantly um, bringing up, um, you know, really fundamental questions that, again, can't be answered, but uh, should serve even as cracked mirrors as we, you know, try to uh, reflect ourselves into our own lives and also project it. And I also want to point out that um, as I was processing Philip Roth's personal library, there are just so many books that he was using as research material for this particular novel. So he was just very precise, wanted to get all the facts right. So countless books on polio. So he read all about polio and then so many different books about summer camps, even children's books about summer camps, summer camp activities, uh, sports, javelin throwing, diving, um, and even Native American lore. So this leads us into, um, into Lawrence's question. Um, Lawrence, I can un unmute you. You can ask it if you like. If you're there, go ahead. Nope. Okay. Um, what would have been the purpose of the long and somewhat boring description of the campfire scene at the camp? Um, well, first, I, I, I just saw a chat. Um, it seems like uh, this curly, uh, this whirly curly uh, doesn't seem to be related to many other curlies, but I saw there was a question whether I, I was related to uh, someone here in um, Money Making Manhattan, and I, I, I do not uh, think so. Um, but um, but anyway, I, I, I think that, um, again, I'm not going to try to uh, intuit the Rothian intent, uh, but it definitely, um, uh, for myself, uh, I guess I'd call it a gift that I'm able to uh, read a story over and over again, and yet uh, still be astonished without uh, the scale of that astonishment diminished by um, any kind of uh, um, engagement over and over again. Uh, you know, for example, American Pastoral, when I get to chapter six and I read, she had become a Jane. 
she become a Jane? She become a what? Wait, what is Mary Livov doing here? Uh, so I would say in some ways that that scene um, imparts a certain kind of reverie and in some ways um, um, uh, prevents the reader who is uh, probably been theorizing what is the fate of this narrative what is going to happen to Buck, uh, to Bucky Cantor that all of a sudden we're in the Poconos all of a sudden we have just all the youthful vitality Pache a virus that is making its way and uh you just have a kind of tableau of sheer joy and bliss until the devastating um, you know, I've had several students that said, like, geez, John, I, I, I think I'm going to have to go into therapy just uh, jump, jumping from uh, section two to section three when all of a sudden you learn about what happened to uh, Bucky. Uh, but yeah, so I think it's a, a kind of um, a setup. I, what I really admire about Philip Roth is that uh, he can really manipulate in, in, in no cheap or mechanistic or schematic way, but he can really manipulate um, the reader. Uh, you know, I tell students that uh, when you read, uh, when you meet Rita Corbin, um, one of many of Swede's foils in American Pastoral, I say to students, I say, you know, it's almost like the scene in uh, Brian De Palma's 1976 adaptation of Stephen King's Carrie, where Sissy Spacek is on stage, and all of a sudden the popular kids uh, do that terrible prank, and all of a sudden they die, and you as a viewer just can't help indulge that uh, sick desire to see them die more quickly. Well, um, I say to students, to say, when I meet Rita um, um, in American Pastoral, it's like, I feel like I want to get out my piano wire, wire and just go in back of her and just squeeze that neck, and then I just realize, like, this is horrid. All of my humanistic, curly attitudes and values are going out the window, and I think that... Um, Roth is just an uh, expert in just being able to not only have you shift perspective and subjectivities with uh, along with the characters, seeing it from this angle, seeing it from that angle, uh, seeing that from this abyss. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, it gives a, it, it, it even packs a greater um, uh, propulsive punch into your psyche to just see all of that. Um, yeah that languished sort of nothing's happening. It reminds me in some ways of like the beginning of one of the greatest short stories. Let's go back to Jimmy Joyce, The Dead, that at the beginning, it's just like, okay, we're at a party, but uh, hey, Jimmy, give me a story. What's happening? It just seems like uh, we're just going through a story, uh, sorry, uh, through a party, and there's no definitive kind of plot line, just like the beginning of Martin Scorsese's 1990 Goodfellas, where the camera just roams through an Italian social club of uh, made men. It's like, okay, um, not sure where we are. And then all of a sudden, we are intensively in that kind of environment. And I think that that is, um, in some ways, um, it's a setup to just the, you know, despairing final uh, section. And again, I, I, I never uh, find Roth to be uh, cheap thrills or cheap uh, tears. Um, yeah, um, I, I would say that all of the tear stains in my volume are hard won, and uh, I'm not one to go for gimmicks. Uh, but that said, um, writing, good writing is all about gimmicks. And uh, I would encourage you, if you haven't spanned yourselves into reading other Roth uh, novels, he's one of the few um, authors that's able to um, generate styles rather than, you know, usually we'd like to come to the signature style. We, 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 uh, that's how we choose so much of our, you know, creative and non-creative uh, worlds is like the formula, the signature, we like that, but he's able to like multiply the signature Roth style. And um, I always start with um, American Pastoral and move to Nemesis so students can just see uh, the convoluted subjectivity of um, uh, Zuckerman and then move into this different kind of even sentence by sentence syntactical structure. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever um, be able to um, uh, cultivate Roth uh, scholars like uh, Ira Nadell that I'm so glad is uh, joining us. Um, yes, I uh, am a dear fan, uh, but I, I think that um, uh, it, going back to Baldwin saying that, you know, I've always known that I've achieved something if at least one, uh, one reader reading my books has a changed consciousness, just even some slight shift, I, I know I've done something. And so with my classes, um, I do know uh, that it's through the portal of Philip Roth 
in his new work, in his uh, art, um, that students have really um, changed their attitude uh, to um, what literature is and what fiction is. And uh, it brings us into great discussions of narratives. It's like, okay, if this book is all made up and it's just a, a fiction, what does that make you? Well, I, I'm, I'm alive. It's like, yes, but we're constantly cultivating stories. We are uh, the notes that we tell ourselves and put within the envelope of our identity. And we think that it's secure and comprehensive and robust. And yes, it is. But uh, I do not know the same John Curley that any of you people are perceiving right now. Um, am I not getting my, I'm probably not getting my story straight. Um, the, the, the great Rothian character and scholar Nathan Zuckerman tells me it's all about getting people wrong. I'm getting myself wrong. I'm probably getting Roth wrong and Nemesis wrong and all your questions wrong, uh, but uh, at least at least I'm trying. Try again, fail again, fail better, Samuel Beckett tells me. Um, and it, again, I hear so much about Philip Roth, like the humor and uh, whatnot, but I think that um, he's no less relentless than Beckett, uh, than uh, Kafka. And uh, I, I, I think that uh, for me, the reckoning with those kind of uh, awfuls, uh, authors, not awfuls, uh, is um, oftentimes really painful. And it's all often estranging oneself from one's, you know, uh, typical notions of identity or society or one's possibilities. But I think that, again, it's hard hitting. Um, I. I think that Philip Roth can be very funny. And, you know, I, I live on 25th Street. I'm five blocks from where he wrote Portnoy's Complaint on 300 East 30th Street. Um, every time I pass the, uh, that intersection, I always look up um, and uh, imagine that I'm seeing um, uh, Philip Roth conversing with uh, Mr. Portnoy. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that he's also just so much more devastating than so many other really uh, first class um, international writers. Um, and it can be really, really difficult. But uh, and again, um, as I said, uh, truth is where the danger lies. And uh, it can be dangerous and disheartening and despairing. Uh, but we need uh, we need our Roths and we need our Bucky Cantors. And we need you um, as well. Next, we got Victor. Um, Victor, if you just want to. Uh... Mute. If you want to unmute yourself and ask. Am I unmuted? Oh, Go ahead. Hey, I'm so glad I wandered into the Newark Public Library and I found your wonderful Philip Roth room and I found out about the session. I got to read Nemesis. But uh, it was interesting that Bucky is turned off and rejects his own Jewish background and is turned off at the cemetery scene and uh, rejects God. But then you have this whole thing at the summer camp with the Indian lore, what we would call today cultural appropriation. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Blomdack says you have to read these books. What's this whole thing about the uh, Indian stuff, which seems to be decidedly not Indian? And wh what's that all about? What do you think that's all about? I, again, I, I, I think it's childhood indulgences, and I think it's also um, in a interview with uh, David Rumnick of The New Yorker, he was talking about the human stain, uh, but was mentioning how Coleman Silk, uh, you know, uh, is fired from a uh, his uh, academic position uh, for um, using a racist slur. Um, he meant ghost, but it was construed spook as a uh, um, anti-Black um, uh, epithet. And um, one finds out that, uh, you know, Coleman Silk, um, this so-called racist um, classics uh, professor, is actually an African-American uh, from Newark. Uh, but there's a meditation in the book about, like, you know, why not be whatever you want to be? Um, we can call it appropriation, and at times it is. But um, just as it is with uh, free speech and so many issues, hot-button issues that it may be perceived uh, a context by context uh, basis. And, you know, keep in mind, I'm, I'm the kind of person that as a child would always wander down to uh, uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts on Thanksgiving Day with my brother, hoping to build a time machine so we could get there just as the Mayflower was coming into the harbor and we could beat back uh, those uh, uh, Puritans 
and um, have the novelty of 2016 or 2020 that, my gosh, wow, this is the first time that the United States has ever elected a white male. It's always been an indigenous female. Um, but yeah, so I think that appropriation um, is worn uh, lightly. It is, of course, uh, it could be uh, deemed uh, less than desirable, but I think that it's this kind of notion of being able to dissolve yourself like a lozenge into the American dream of becoming uh, whatever. But I think it's it, it's true that he tends to, it seems like the, um, the Jewish um, uh, culture um, is so alert and alive, Dr. Steinberg, um, and so many people in the community, but uh, Bucky, um, I think in some ways that the umbilical cord has been uh, cut. There's a, there's a notion of like a, a, a lack of roots because of not having uh, a mother that lived uh, past childbirth, a father who was a thief and whatnot. So I think that he finds himself um, only having a very uh, thin relationship to so much except um, responsibility, civic responsibility and moral responsibility and a notion perhaps too clear a notion as Arnie uh, uh, instructs uh, that uh, he thinks that uh, the, the, the staple um, um, piece of his identity is a notion of what God is or is not. Um, and, um, you know, Arnie and uh, many even readers would just think that like this reductive notion of anthropomorphizing um, a God or assuming that uh, the God agency is uh, responsible for your personal fate is just uh, a kind of overdetermination and perhaps a simplification of what one's cultural and theological identity uh, should be. But uh, um, yeah, I guess that's my run out way of trying to come to terms uh, with that. Thank you. Next, uh, we've got time for two more comments and questions. I see a comment from Deborah, let's see, Deborah, if you would like to ask it out loud, you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Wasn't expecting to do that. Um, I was born in York in Weequick and um, left <laughs> uh, left for the next door town right after the riots in 68. Um, but my point was that um, I have an older brother and it just seemed like there were so many scholar athletes, incredible young men that were part of that community. And I, I don't know the reason why, but it just looking back, it seemed like there were so many people like Bucky before he was sick um, that were revered and thought so highly of and had all these skills, were athletic and scholars. And, um, and it just makes me feel more and more about that community was so unique and special. Uh, and of course, disintegrated uh, for many reasons after after the riots. Um, and I, that was just my comment. I just, I don't know why there were so many, but it just felt like there were. And uh, my last comment was, I, I'm living in Plymouth actually near Bridgewater, <laughs> so um, ironically, <laughs> but anyway, thank you. That was all I wanted to say. Thanks. Well, I'm thank very you. upset that I lost my uh, New England accent. It was uh, the verbal bullying of people in Northern Virginia for two years living in uh, Falls Church, Virginia. Um, I came back to Massachusetts and I had lost my accent and uh, everyone in my linguistic community who I grew up with, I could all of a sudden hear that non-roticity, the, the lack of the R, um, and then I think spending time in Northern Ireland and uh, whatnot. But I'm a proud um, New Englander. And yeah, I'd point out uh, a good friend of mine, Bob Singer, who actually we became friends when he said like, you know, I just recently retired and uh, I'd love to take your class. And it's like, please, anyone who wants to take my class, they don't have to be an NGIT student. Higher education should be free. But he's a 1961 um, graduate of Weequaic, and he said that from 1950 to 1960, like Weequaic High School graduated more PhDs that, than any other high school um, in New Jersey. And I think it might even be spanning even more so in the Northeast quarter. But it was uh, certainly, um, you know, again, I, I, I'm someone that never ever uh, reads literature or poetry with a kind of single-mindedness. Uh, I have many minds as we all do, so I'm always looking to try to analyze many different ways, but uh, 
Yes, uh, Roth is, um, you know, a historical guide to the lost Jewish community of uh, Newark. I brought students a couple of years before the pandemic uh, from the Honors College, a tour of downtown. And I said, here we are on Mulberry Street. Isn't this beautiful, beautiful Chinatown? Um, and students just looked around. It's like Prudential Center, Gateway Plaza. Where's Chinatown? It's like, that's right. It's right here. It doesn't exist, but it's all around us. And it did exist. And therefore, as long as it's chronicled, as long as it's embedded in the narrative uh, or your psyche, it's still here. But uh, yeah, the, the Wequaic uh, section uh, and its uh, Jewish identity um, is one that um, I, I think that will always uh, be intact, um, but it should be enlarged as well. Um, and that also it's, you know, contemporary iteration as a predominantly middle-class African-American community too. That needs to be uh, looked at uh, as well. Um, but please give my uh, my best to Plymouth. I was uh, just there several weeks ago, walking on the jetty in the harbor with my father. So uh, it's wonderful to have the vicarious thrill of leaving, uh, not leaving you all, but uh, leaving this New York um, apartment and getting back to Southeast Massachusetts. We are going to squeeze in two last comments, and here we go. Rick is next. Rick, go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Uh, kind of off topic, but uh, he's been mentioning American Pastoral. And I uh, certainly don't have time, but I'd like him to think about it for another talk. Uh, as a former SDS activist in the 60s and early 70s, uh, the American Pastoral happens to be my favorite Philip Roth book, but I have a concern that he portrayed in that book anti-war activists as terrorists, and I certainly wasn't. My friends and people I worked with weren't, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear people talk about that at some point. Well, Rick, thank uh, you, Rick. I I, I absolutely uh, agree. Um, and th there was someone that uh, was a member of SDS that uh, did go into my father's classroom when he was trying to uh, teach uh, at Harvard University in, I think, 1968. And uh, this the student uh, said to my father, who had taken a course with my father, Tom Curley, uh, stop teaching. You know, Vietnam War is happening and whatnot. My father said, I have to teach. And uh, he said, when the revolution comes down, he'll be the first to be liquidated. Um, my father wasn't liquidated. I am evidence of that. Uh, but they actually became friends. And, and um, I, uh, knowing the history of SDS, um, I think that even the behavior of this former student of my father's uh, is quite uh, reductive and caricatural. And I've even um, met, um, uh, some years ago, I met near Columbia, a bartender who had been part of uh, Weatherman. And um, uh, I've also met in Northern Ireland uh, Republican uh, nationalists who, you know, were very upset with innocent life being lost. But uh, other, than, you know, rather than having the kind of uh, the uh, a uh, uh, apologies in posterity, um, that person that I met that was in uh, Weatherman, and he had some credible arguments, uh, cre ones that I uh, would rationalize and not necessarily justify. But he didn't um, um, characterize himself even morphing from CD, uh, SDS to Weatherman of saying like, oh, you know, I was naive and uh, uh, physical force is always wrong and everything that the organization did. No, he was adamant that I think that uh, in, if you see the context of what my life was and what the country was, um, I'm sorry, um, the passive uh, civil disobedience um, just didn't work uh, for many people that I was uh, we, we try to push back against the Vietnam War, it becomes escalated. Uh, we, we get involved um, with civil rights and we see that uh, progress is almost nil. So are we going to allow this police state to just uh, run their armored uh, tanks across our bodies and our ideals? No way. And I thought that was refreshing that rather than, you know, I saw Mark Rudd in the New York Times mentioned that like years ago, uh, there was uh, a townhouse in Greenwich Village that blew up. Uh, I wasn't there, but I knew about it. And uh, um, and I justified his position of saying I was wrong several decades ago, but I think that uh, it'd be very reductive to say you, Rick, or many other folks um, that joined um, many of these activist groups um, were uh, 
misguided uh, or had uh, psychological issues. Uh, it's noteworthy. I said to students that uh, I once wrote, wrote a paper in graduate school that every single Hollywood film that has depicted um, the Irish Republican Army um, in uh, from the Devil's Own Patriot Games, uh, blown away. There's a few others, but there's always the equation of um, national liberation as being terrorism as being a form of psychosis. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones and, uh, is a bomber and blown away, who's also like crazy. So the state wants to identify that any anti-state activity must be deranged. And uh, again, that is not only psychologically, uh, but empirically reductive and uh, wrong. Thank you, um, Harry, you have a comment? You can unmute yourself and go ahead. Um, yes, so I noticed a couple of passages in the book when the public health officials in Newark are talking about how important it is to um, to not panic and tell your kids it's all going to be fine and carry on life as usual. Um, that seemed kind of far from what's happened recently, where there's kind of an effort to tell people that there is something to be deeply scared of, especially during the COVID pandemic. So that was an interesting, uh, the adults being less concerned than the kids who start kind of freaking out and ganging up on each other. That was, uh, it's like the contagion of fear and blame is happening more among the kids than the adults. It seemed interesting. Yeah, you know, it's a good point, Harry. And it's, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the attitude, uh, is one that when I think about it, how, how it's been uh, sometimes rendered and sometimes adjudicated by different critics. Um, I think it was 1994, the Roberto Benigni film, Life is Beautiful, um, which um, really uh, was vigorously enjoyed by many people. Um, you know, a, a father and son are, uh, uh, after Crystal Knot are apprehended and are in a Nazi, uh, concentration camp and for allowing uh, the uh, child to be able to uh, preserve himself and his his wits uh, and his well-being his father makes it seem as if it's um, you know all just a game um, which um, it's it's interesting because yeah are those uh, parents uh, uh, giving uh, um, are they providing uh the 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 sanest recourse to deal with calamity or you know uh the german cultural critic theodore adorno mentions uh you know there's a scene in the great dictator with uh charlie chaplin and he just mentions um you know in, in terms of like the the sin of uh aestheticizing and covering up the real he's he mentions that um you know, at one scene, these uh, Gestapo are coming up the stairwell and a little girl throws an object at them and they fall down slapstick. And Adorno says that the fact that a little Jewish girl uh, even uh, batting, uh, averting her gaze or doing whatever would be torn uh, to pieces like wolves uh, just shows that this kind of uh, um, transmutation of the horrific uh, historical record into something that is comical is just, uh, you know, Awful. I mean, he also said, you know, you cannot re, uh, write poetry after Auschwitz, uh, which uh, is a shame that someone who knew the true powers of art would utter so something again that uh, is um, I can rationalize, but disagree with all my soul. Uh, but yeah, whether it is uh, even during a pandemic, um, uh, my three-year-old turning. Uh, to four-year-old. Uh, I was constantly caught, you know, in the snares of like, I don't want to, you know, varnish the truth of uh, this, you know, world catastrophe. And yet I also don't want a small person to all of a sudden find themselves completely um, besides themselves. So yeah, I, I even just rereading last night, Harry, uh, it, should you be, um, giving that kind of parental uh, or ha having that uh, projecting that kind of um, um, sensibility. Um, 
Good question. Yeah. Okay, so our next book club meeting will take place on September 9th, and our host in France, Stephen Sampson, chose to discuss Portnoy's complaint, so that should be very interesting. Thank you for joining us today, and much, much thanks to John Curley for leading this discussion. Thank you. It has been recorded and will be available on the Newark Public Library's Facebook page, and I will also add it to the Philip Roth Personal Library's YouTube channel this afternoon. Thank you to Eric Royce from our IT department for assisting with this program and to Nancy Shields, our Philip Roth Library Associate for providing support for this program. And I hope to reconnect with all of you again in September. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Nadine, thank you so much. And everyone, thank you for joining me on, at least in New York, this rainy, dreary a day. But it's all about the new arc of Newark. And uh, I'm really delighted and grateful for having this occasion of being with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.